How many of you have one of these? This is a moleskin. This is a sketchbook. This is a container for ideas. Keep your hands up. Wow. That's a lot of people. Actually, hold your book up if you have one. Wow. OK, and, and what I'm about to tell you, when I say Q moleskin, I just need you to do that again, OK? <laughs> awesome. Well, my book is just like yours. My book is full of ideas. It's full of sketches. It's full of stories and inspiration. My book also has blank pages, just like yours, right? Pages that are waiting for us to fill them with stories and concepts. This book has seen a lot. There are some crazy product and business ideas in here that have never seen the light of day. Today, I want to tell you about one that's jumped from these pages into the real world. And the story is Airbnb. And it starts here at the Rhode Island School of Design, where I was pursuing a double major in industrial and graphic design. This moleskin saw a lot of use. It got a workout. It's at RISD where we learned to solve problems creatively. It was also at RISD where I met this guy. This is Brian Chesky. And we were industrial design students together at RISD. And besides studying the same subject, we had something else in common. We both knew that one day we wanted to be entrepreneurs. So this feeling was so strong that I actually sat Brian down before we graduated and said, Brian, I know that one day, at some point in the future, we're going to start a business together. And Brian looked at me and he kind of laughed it off. But I knew there was some truth to that. So he went off to Los Angeles. I moved to San Francisco. And I moved here to be an industrial designer. I was working in the city for a book publisher doing package design for them. I was living in this great apartment right in downtown San Francisco. It was spacious. It had lots of light. <laughs> it was a great way to get Brian to move up from Los Angeles to San Francisco. And he did. The minute that he did, we both quit our jobs to become entrepreneurs. We let go of the salary. We let go of the paycheck and the benefits. And we took the plunge into the unknown. And um, there was a problem, <laughs> is that the minute he moved up, our rent went up. And suddenly, we found ourselves unable to afford our own apartment. We had to think, and we had to think fast. It just so happens, that same weekend, a design conference was coming to San Francisco that was so big, all the hotels had sold out in the city. So, Q Moleskin. We started to think creatively about how we could solve our problem of not being able to pay the rent. So we're sketching away in our living room. And we're starting to, to think, hmm, man, we've got some extra space here. <laughs> There's more over there. Oh, look at all this extra space. And we started to come up with this idea of what if we were able to blow up an air mattress, put it in our living room, and rent it out to designers who need a place to stay for the conference. We could go so far as to cook them breakfast. <laughs> By the end of that night, we had this concept called air bed and breakfast. <laughs> so naturally, we wanted to list our air beds somewhere on the internet. And um, we made the logical next move. We went and we looked at Craigslist. This made sense, right? No. These people are going to be sleeping in our living room. We want to know who they are. So we decided to make our own site. This is the first version of Airbed and Breakfast. We made this in 24 hours. We had a site up, and we encountered our next problem, which is, how are people going to find out about Airbed and Breakfast? <laughs> so that night before bed, Brian and I, we emailed the top design bloggers that we could think of. And when we woke up the next morning, it felt like Christmas. There we were at the top of some of our favorite blogs, Swiss Miss, Core 77, Unbeige. And suddenly, this idea that we had 48 hours earlier was now live on the internet. 
and we had people start writing us from around the world who wanted to stay in our living room. <laughs> so think for a minute. What type of person do you think would sleep on an airbed in somebody's living room? Probably dudes. Probably pretty young. Strapped for cash just out of college. That's what we thought too. We were totally wrong. We had three people stay with us all over the age of 30. We had Kat, Amol, and Michael. Together, the three of them helped us solve our problem. We made our rent that month. We made $1,000, right? They saved our apartment. But they actually did more than that. They shared their stories with us. Amol, Amol was a grad student in India, told us about this amazing thesis project. He was doing artificial intelligence. Kat's a web designer from Boston who gave us tips on how to improve the website. Collectively, the three of them inspired us to make air, bed, and breakfast real. So we added a new teammate. <laughs> this is Nathan Blasharzik, our third co-founder. We now had design and engineering expertise on a founding team. And together, the three of us decided, hey, this, this works for a conference in San Francisco. What if we did this for conferences around the United States? That makes sense. People can share air beds for conferences. So every year, um, we, we saw that there was a conference coming up in Austin, Texas. Every year around March, South by Southwest happens. And every year, the same thing happens. Hotels sell out. People need a place to stay last minute. So we thought this was a perfect opportunity to launch the next version of Air Bed and Breakfast. <laughs> One problem. We had 14 days. After a couple of all-nighters, a lot of Red Bull, we got the next version of the site up. This was housing for conferences, Air Bed and Breakfast 2.0. So we used the site ourselves to go to Austin. And we learned two invaluable things that forever changed the company. The first is that it's extremely awkward to exchange money in person, right? We were having a great experience with our hosts, and then suddenly the conversation turned to, where's my money? <laughs> and we're like, ah, oh, gosh, this just feels so wrong. So we started to wonder. <laughs> we started to wonder, what if you could book a room with the simplicity of using your credit card, just like a hotel. You could book an average person's room, just like uh, a hotel room. The second thing we learned is that people wanted to travel beyond conferences, right? We were so limited in our scope that we didn't see the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that people wanted to travel this way anywhere around the world. And so we revamped the site, Air Bed and Breakfast 3.0 launched in the summer of 2008. And we now had online transactions, and you can book a place anywhere in the world. We encounter our next problem. How do people find out about Air Bed and Breakfast? Well, it just so happens in the summer of 2008, the press were writing stories about a really big event that was coming up. If you remember back to August of 2008, this was happening. The Democratic National Convention in Denver, Colorado. Barack Obama giving his acceptance speech to 100,000 people, but only 30,000 hotel rooms. The press were having a heyday with this. They said, uh, housing panic hits Denver. Where will they stay? <laughs> right? So we timed our launch just in time for the, the Democratic National Convention. And it worked. It actually felt like the design blogs all over again, except this time it was national. So we went from three guys working out of a living room with no money to three guys working out of a living room with no money, but we had a ton of press. <laughs> we thought we made it. Look at this. Look at that spike. This is it. Hallelujah. <laughs> We were wrong. <laughs> in fact, it was this lull, this time uh, in the history of Airbnb where a lot of people don't know about us. Um, they call this, this part in, in the startup world, they call this the, the trough of sorrow, is what they call this time, where nobody's using your website and you have to figure out how to get people to actually use it. So when you have a marketplace and nobody is using your marketplace, you have a lot of time on your hands. <laughs> and that's when we cued moleskin, and we started, we had this crazy kind of um, late night 
uh, brainstorm in the kitchen where we, we thought, what if, what if we were able to give our hosts a gift, maybe like a, a breakfast that they could give to their guests? So we said, well, let's give them a, a breakfast cereal that they can hand off to their guests. And one thing led to another, and we just started to brainstorm, what if Obama had his own breakfast cereal? And we said, wow, that could be actually kind of funny. It had this caricature of him, rays of light coming from behind the cereal bowl. And we came up with a really funny name for this breakfast cereal called Obama-O's. In fact, I brought a box here. So we actually made the cereal from an idea that we had in our moleskin. And we thought, man, this design is so cool. Like, we bet people would want to buy this. But how are we going to get the attention of people? So we went so far as to create a jingle for the cereal. Do you want to hear the jingle? Everybody's talking about Obama O's And just one bite and you will understand Cause every single O sings yes we can So we're, we're a bipartisan company. If you do a, an Obama cereal, you have to do a McCain cereal. This is during the presidential election, don't forget. So um, knowing that John McCain was an officer in the Navy, we came up with <laughs> Cat McCain's, a maverick in every bite. <laughs> and as you can imagine, we created a jingle for Cat McCain's as well. Cat McCain's have all you need to succeed Driving that straight talk express at full speed Stay the course Never surrender with every bite You're a freedom defender <laughs> So those are the two jingles. We ended up making uh, 500 of each box. We numbered each one on the top. It was a very limited edition collector's item. And um, they ended up on CNN. So here we were doing an interview on CNN about breakfast cereal. After that piece went live, orders started flying in. We were selling the boxes for $40 a piece. All right, these are very limited edition collector's items. So we'd, we'd have to go to the grocery store and buy hundreds of boxes of cereal at a time. We'd bring them back to our kitchen <laughs> and we'd actually box every single box of cereal in our kitchen. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> Nate's like, cereal? Guys, I gotta go back to Boston. The Obama O's went on to be resold on eBay. They went on to be sold on uh, Craigslist for $350. And we ended up selling out of Obama O's. And at $40 a box and 500 boxes, we made over $20,000 from breakfast cereal. And this is how we funded Airbnb in the early days, by selling cereal. <laughs> the, uh, the Cat McCain's, by the way, didn't sell so well. <laughs> and uh, we ended up eating those for, uh, for breakfast. <laughs> but it was this project that got the attention of an incubator program in California called Y Combinator. They loved the hustle. They loved the scrappiness that we had. And um, we applied to the program we got in. The program's... Um, it's harder to get into this program than it is at the Harvard. So we were very, very fortunate to get into this program. The best part about it is that it brought the team back together. Nate flew back from Boston, and for three months he slept on an airbed in the floor of my room. And together the three of us decided for the next three months we were going to do whatever it took to make Airbnb a profitable company. And when I say profitable, I mean there's a term called ramen profitable, where you're making just enough to pay rent and buy ramen. <laughs> So in order to reach this goal, we drew a graph of what would we have to make per week on the site to reach ramen profitability. We taped the graph to our bathroom mirror, and every morning we looked at it. Every night we saw it before we went to bed. And we got back to work. A lot of late hours, working out of the apartment. Um, but we knew that we needed to do something a little bit different. Um, and that's when we cued moleskin, and we started to think creatively about how we could um, get the site going a little bit more. And one of those ideas was to actually leave our apartment and go out into the world and go meet the people using our website. So we did just that. 
we traveled all around the country meeting our users, and um, they gave us some of the best feedback we could have ever gotten. Words started getting out. People were talking about us. I think Airbnb is about to change my life. Ha! <laughs> and then this guy signed up. This is David. He lives here in New York City. David is the drummer for Barry Manilow, <laughs> which means he's on tour quite a bit. He's out of his apartment two to three weeks out of every month, and when he's not there, he lists it on Airbnb. And this is the first entire apartment that we had listed on our site. And so the marketplace started to widen a little bit. We went from airbeds to private rooms, and now we had entire apartments. And um, the way you could book this now is very simple. You click the Book It button, put in your credit card, you get a reservation. After the stay, David leaves a review for you, and you leave a review for David. The marketplace continued to expand. We have places in the Hamptons now. We have beautiful places in the heart of Paris, entire apartments. You can even stay at a Frank Lloyd Wright house in Wisconsin. You can actually book this by the night. Before Airbnb, it would be impossible to even find this place. Another architectural great, the Richard Meyer Smith House in Connecticut, now available on Airbnb. The market's expanding. <laughs> we actually have tree houses on the site. <laughs> this is Harrison. He built this tree house for his kids, who then went off to school, and suddenly he's like, hmm, what can I do with this tree house? <laughs> he discovered Airbnb and listed it. There's now a six month wait list if you want to stay in the tree house. <laughs> Harrison pays his mortgage every month by renting the treehouse. <laughs> There's boats on the site. You can stay in boats all around the world. You can stay in a castle. We even have private islands on the site. You can literally book an island for $400 a night. So, do you guys think I can outdo this? <laughs> you can even book an igloo. So the market's expanding even beyond accommodations. People are listing all types of things, including cars. You can book a Tesla in San Francisco through Airbnb. This is a co-working space. You can actually book an office slash co-working space through our site. This is an event, uh, an event space. It's an art gallery in Chicago that you can book by the day. So the marketplace is widening. In fact, just as this is a source of uh, a canvas for us to get our ideas down, Airbnb has become a canvas too. This is what we call the iPhone tent. Um, this is the Apple store in San Francisco. <laughs> you can see where this is going. Um, this guy decided he wanted to be first in line, and so he put his tent up on Airbnb, and he rented out the extra space in his tent. He got picked up across the internet. And he ended up renting the space, and it paid for his iPhone. <laughs> so what's happened is we started with airbeds. And what we've done is we've blossomed into this open marketplace of space, much like eBay did with stuff. This is where we are today. We recently crossed a million nights booked on the site. And actually. <laughs> Um, I, thank you. A lot of those nights, a lot of those nights were right here in New York City. So I, um, I asked a firm out in California called Stamen Design to help us do some visualizations of Airbnb's story in, in, in New York City. And so what you're looking at here is, is a heat map of where available Airbnb listings are in Manhattan. And this is back in 2008. These were our early adopters. Looks like quite a bit going on here in the Lower East Side. This is 2009. This is today. Let's zoom out a little bit. This is Manhattan, greater parts of Brooklyn. These are everyday New Yorkers renting the extra space in their apartment. This is last night. I'm staying on Airbnb right now. I have an awesome apartment in the West Village, rented by a woman named Catherine. She's out on vacation right now, so I have the whole place to myself. And when I walked in, this is what I was greeted with. I had a very personalized welcome letter 
I had a Metro card waiting for me and I had Catherine's favorite takeout spots ready to go. I just instantly felt like I lived here. In fact, this morning I walked out the door to come to the conference and somebody stopped me in the street and said, hey, uh, can you give me some directions to this place? And I was like, whoa, <laughs> I actually feel like a New Yorker, I'm living in an apartment. <laughs> so it's this social connection, connecting with the person and their spaces. It's about real spaces and real people on Airbnb. This is what we never anticipated, but this has been the secret sauce behind Airbnb. I found a couple other people who feel these sentiments as well. The biggest difference between Airbnb and a hotel, I never wanted to leave a thank you gift in a hotel. Airbnb is probably the greatest thing since sliced bread. This is going to change the way people travel. So speaking of traveling, I wanted to see how New Yorkers traveled on Airbnb. And we pulled up some more data, which I'd like to share with you now. So what you're looking at is a graph. This is actually a really cool graph of how New Yorkers uh,